Ah, nothing can ever just be good, can't it? We all wanted the i9 and the MacBook Pros, so we got the i9 and the MacBook Pros, but they didn't do it the way we wanted to do it. Supposed to be faster than they are, and Drew shaved his beard. Nothing can go the way you want it, I'm sorry. But there's been a lot of research done on it by much more educated people than I, and people that own this thing. I don't need to buy this thing, but a lot of people are talking about it, so here are my thoughts on the down-throttling situation with the MacBook Pros. The key word that is being thrown around a lot in this debate is optimization. So what is funny to me about the whole complaining about down throttling, even though we have YouTubers like Jonathan Morrison that are showing us how to solve these down throttling problems, or at least make them not as bad as they may seem. As soon as I got back from my vacation, I was reading about all the down throttling issues, and a lot of headlines were making it out to say the i7 is actually a faster CPU than the i9 in the MacBook Pro because of the cooling issues with the i9, which in several instances happened to be true, but for for the majority of people, it doesn't look like that was going to actually happen. Jonathan Morrison, in his video, was demonstrating how many different situations the i9, once again, outperformed the regular i7 of this year's MacBook. Now, of course, a lot of people are saying it's not as fast as it's supposed to be. Apple advertised it would be faster. And I'm not trying to say in this video that Apple's completely in the right. I think they may have hyped up the speed a little bit in the marketing too much. But there is no denying that the i9 MacBook Pro is a performance boost when mostly using the proper codec or using the proper program. And my other issue with people complaining about the down throttling issues is that they're accrediting it all to Apple and not all on Adobe. Sure, I admit that Apple was marketing this thing way faster than it probably actually is, but Adobe has had a long track record of very poor optimization with Macs that I wanted to bring up another professional computer made by Apple that was not accused as down throttling as much, the iMac Pro, which came out just seven months ago. Jonathan Morrison also did a video on that showing how fast the different core options were for the iMac Pro between the 8 core, the 10 core, and the 18 core. And what you'll find in those charts is that it's a very similar test result to the i7 core with the 15 inch MacBook Pro of this year and the i9 core. Yes, the i9 is faster, not by much, but keep in mind, you're not paying that much extra when you look at the configuration options. So going back into earlier this year when the 18 core model launched, he showed some export tests between Final Cut and Adobe Media Encoder and After Effects. And what we notice is that when it's an optimized program like Final Cut, usually for that 18 core CPU, you get like an extra minute of export. How much extra is that? Let's look at the Apple Store. $3,200, you pay an extra three grand and you save about a minute of exporting time when you're exporting a basic Final Cut video. Now, obviously, it's a lot more than that when you're exporting bigger projects and of course, if you're using this thing on a daily basis, yes, there can be applications in which having all of those cores at the same time can be more helpful, but the interesting thing to remember from his iMac Pro video is that once he started testing Adobe apps, the utilization was thrown out the window. The optimization was terrible. The way that Adobe handles apps Apple CPUs is basically like throwing tape at the wall and hoping it sticks. We even saw 10 core CPUs that cost $800 extra over the baseline 8 core end up being slower in certain exports with Adobe apps. Meaning that if you paid less for the iMac Pro and you're an Adobe fan, you would actually get better performance than if you would have ordered the 10 core version. Is that because the 8 core CPU is faster than the 10? No. This is Adobe not really caring about how their apps work. When I got my 2016 MacBook Pro, I was a die-hard Adobe fan. I hated Final Cut, never wanted to switch to it, never wanted to use it. I was all about After Effects and Premiere. And I was using my MacBook Pro and realizing that this software is not built for this computer. Yes, it can technically run on Mac OS, but they are not utilizing this properly at all. Export times took forever. The battery life was sacrificed. The fans would kick into overdrive and be at full blast to the point that it actually convinced me to try out the free trial of Final Cut. And once I did, I was like, my battery life's good. The fans aren't that loud, the exporting is faster. Why am I not using this? Also, it's a single time purchase, which is my issue with Adobe products. It's a monthly subscription, which by the way, I still have. I still use Premiere Pro and After Effects for certain content that I think it is better than, but for the majority of my videos, I do think Final Cut is more practical. If you're posting videos on a daily basis, that's when I think Final Cut is more useful. Premiere Pro, I would say is more useful for when you're doing more professional short film grade projects or videos that you don't have to make on a daily basis. 
this. Videos that are not too subject to, this needs to get done really quick. If I use Premiere Pro, I'm going to expect a 90 minute export. But if I'm publishing something on a daily basis, then I will go Final Cut. And that's what a lot of these tests were showing us with the i9 versus the i7. Yes, this is a speed increase. It is not a big one, but keep in mind people, they're not charging extra now for the i9s. The MacBook Pro lineup got an entire refresh. We got storage upgrades, we got RAM upgrades. We even got battery internal upgrades in True Tone and the T2 chip that allows for Siri features. We got all these upgrades and the MacBook Pros available now are the same prices as the ones available before with the exception of the added storage options, but those were not there anyway. So yes, now you can buy a $7,000 MacBook Pro, but before you could not buy a four terabyte, 32 gig of RAM MacBook Pro. So keep in mind that when comparing iMac Pro processors, eight core, 10 core, 18 core, you pay like 800 to $3,000 for a change in about a minute of export times. You're kind of dealing with the same thing here. You're only paying an extra $300 to make that switch from an i7 to an i9. Yeah, that extra $300 doesn't drastically change your workflow, but what we've seen with the competition is that a lot of other laptops out there have not been able to adequately give the i9 the cooling mechanisms that it needs if you want your laptop to have a decent battery life in a small build quality. Dave Lee even uploaded a video about the Dell XPS 15, which sports the i9, but once again, it gets down throttled a lot more often than the i5 or the i7. But then of course he did make a video about how to cool down the i9 in the right way. And of course it is this giant thick gaming laptop that is about an inch tall. And if that's the only way you can make an i9 core cool efficiently, then yeah, why are you expecting Apple to make something like that? Apple's whole career has been built on how to make things small, portable, and quiet. So if you want Apple, a company that specializes in how to make things thin and light and efficient, to adopt an i9 core and all these PC companies, they're either down throttling it or putting it into a giant tank of a laptop, the complete opposite of what Apple is going for. And by the way, those gaming laptops, when you're gaming on them, battery life is half the time under an hour. The battery in here isn't small, but it's a pretty serious laptop. I'm only getting around three hours of battery life. That's with screen at 250 nits. And that's not playing games. That's just like regular use. If you're playing games, expect 45 minutes to an hour of battery life, but that's just what it is. That's what gaming laptops are like. Can you imagine how mad users would have been if Apple made something with the proper cooling mechanisms where the i9 wasn't down throttled, but the battery life was like two hours, one hour? Everyone would lose their mind. People get upset that Apple advertises a 10 hour battery and it ends up being six hours. They freak out. And if no one else is able to get this exactly right, even if the Dell XPS doesn't down throttle as much as the MacBook Pro, it's running Mac OS. It has Final Cut Pro. It has optimized software on it that likely results results in a faster export time than you can get with Premiere Pro on the Dell XPS 15 because Adobe doesn't make hardware, they just make software and they're not too focused on how optimized it is. Meaning that we were all asking for something that was never really possible in the first place. You wanted giant increases in speed at no extra cost and you really weren't asking for any design changes other than the keyboard should have more travel. At first I was very skeptical about this MacBook Pro release and I was like, Apple should pull them off the shelves, they should stop selling them immediately, but what I did realize is that even with this down throttling, even with the i9 hexacores and i7 hexacores, these laptops are better and are the same price as the ones Apple was selling a month ago. It's far better that they release these now instead of just continuing to sell the 2017 version longer and longer and longer with the standard quad cores. And no one is giving enough credit to the fact that we now have i7 quad cores on the 13 inch MacBook Pro version, the touch bar. That's a very powerful, very light, thin laptop with four Thunderbolt both three ports on it. That's an impressive laptop. That one's not dealing with down throttling issues. Let's give more credit to that 13 inch version. That's impressive that they're able to stuff that much power into it. So no, the 15 inch MacBook Pro does not have the insane performances we were hoping, but it is still better. And it is the equivalent price of the ones that just came out. So not as drastic as some of the headlines were making it out to be, not to say that the i9 is slower than the i7. And besides that, the i9 from the i7 is only a $300 increase. And in the grand scheme of process, speeds, $300 usually doesn't change very much anyway. So in conclusion, I'm still very glad that they released these laptops. I'm sorry for you diehard Adobe users out there that want to pay $30 a month for this software and are fed up with those stupid one-time offers like Final Cut. No, you need your coloring options, but I also don't want to try DaVinci Resolve, which is free. Also way more optimized than Adobe. No, it has to be Adobe. Well, there were still a lot of tests Jonathan Morrison did where export times, yes, are slow, but are faster with the i9.
fine. So don't take these things too far out of context. There's not really a great way to have a good battery life and a portable design and sport the i9 all in one package. No one else has been able to do it. If you are gonna cool off the i9 adequately, it looks like you have to build a giant gaming laptop with a battery life of 30 minutes. So Apple's not gonna do that. That's not the core audience. That's not how they got the reputation for MacBooks. So don't expect them to do anything like that. I'm still passing on it because I don't have a need for a MacBook Pro, but I hope some of these tests and some of these comparisons to other devices that exist on the market can tell you, yeah, this is probably what you should have expected when hoping Apple would adopt the eighth generation CPUs. Improvements, but not drastic. But don't worry about it. It's the same price as the ones that came out a little bit ago, so don't worry. Anyway, let me know what you think of the i9 MacBook Pro in the comments below. And don't worry, the beard will be growing back soon. This is your Apple Sheep here, and I will see you in the next one.